I see it's two o'clock. Three minutes. Oh no, I've got three minutes. Apologies for that. It's a long time in here. So I was getting some looks at the back. I thought it must be a look. Then it's two o'clock. I thought, oh, let's start. Sorry. I'll go back in three minutes. It just says when. It's definitely two o'clock now. In front of this, so we've been reminded. So a very, very warm welcome again. Should be recording by this point. So I suppose a reminder: this meeting may be recorded and available. Uh, for public consumption on our, on our website. So, first item on the, the agenda today is Hedderin and Apologies. Is that Nick? Are you going through that? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we have an apology from Councillor Johnston, and we have 13 members present at the start of the meeting. That's it, that's everybody here then. Uh, we've still got one vacancy, but that's not getting filled till next week. So I say we accept the group that is. So declarations of interest. Any members got any declarations of interest? No hands are being raised. Item number three is a minute of the previous meeting of 4th of December. So we have a question over that. Over to you, John, first. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, it's uh, agenda item number six, uh, 6.2 where it says, Fuller noted that, as set out in paragraph 3.5 of the report, that there is a follow-up work undertaken to ensure that the agreed recommendations are implemented. And looking at what that actually says, uh, the, the actual wording of 3.5 from the previous uh, meeting that we had in December, the audits will be followed up in due course and any outstanding issues will be reported back to to this committee. Now, uh, it, it, it's referring to outstanding issues. I would have thought that, you know, we would have had a report back on, on all the issues, not just outstanding issues. And the other point I would like to raise on that particular one, because it was reflecting the uh, pension fund, uh, I thought we agreed that a further report would come back to this audit risk and scrutiny, which is not referenced. In, in the agenda. No, you're absolutely correct that um, you do receive update reports on uh, the issues that have been looked at as part of audit reports. Within the report on the pensions fund, it did say that action was being taken and it would form part of the follow-up report to this committee. So they are scheduled for each of your um, meetings throughout 2020 and you will see the um, improvement actions coming here for your consideration. John, I, I suppose uh, I'll come back to you, because Kate, mm -hmm. Kate's wanting as well. You might want to amend the minutes, but I'll ask you at that point in time, or you might be reassured with, with the advice that you've been given. Katie. Thank you, Chair. It may not, it, it's, it's on the same point in terms of this, and it's maybe not specifically to do with the minute as such. However, going forward and getting update reports, can we, or is it within the remit of this committee, to ask that we get regular updates of all the reports coming forward to know that we can see the full process and then we can tick it off. Is that what those update reports are? And if not, is that something that we can request? So, you know, we're getting follow-ups for all of these reports to say this is where they are, they've been to the service committee or not, and what the results are. So, okay, we'll, we'll bring that up under a different point. We're obviously, just looking at them at the moment, relevant point or so for the sake of seeing what's happening, tracking decisions, so on and so forth, I think it's absolutely appropriate with what you've brought up there. Mm -hmm. uh, Liz, do you want to speak just to that in regards to that? Just cover that point, but we'll pick it up somewhere else. Yes, absolutely. That We do have scheduled um, in your committees for the, the forward programme these follow-up reports, so you will see um, the programme. If it would help for you to see a sort of an overview of what you've had and what you've got coming up. Certainly happy to circulate that. Thanks for that. To both. John, are you wanting to amend the minute or would you be reassured? Uh, I'm, I'm reassured, Chair. Uh, it's just that when we mentioned that a further report from the pensions audit, you know, that we did uh, in December, you know, it's, I just thought it would have been reflected in, in the actual minutes itself. That, that was all. That's the point I was trying to raise. No, no, thanks very much for that. So as part of that, we may well bring in a, a, an item of business. I won't take it today under any, any other competent, but actually it looks at that whole flow, that, how that works. And we can address it, have a, a conversation then we actually see it. Jane, aye. 
I, I was just going to say to members that um, the forward plan that we're given, um, you know, it comes, comes forward, should, I would mm -hmm. hope, um, contain information about what is to be followed up and why. So I mean, it, it's all there if we look forward in the forward plan. So I we see that, but I think you're asking specifically for this committee to see that, Joan. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's just when reflecting back to 3.5, which is actually says here in the, in the, the minutes, in 3.5 it says the audits will follow up in due course, and yet when we look at another item further on in the papers, uh, I can find it, 3.5 actually says that the audits will be followed up in six months' time, and any outstanding issues will be reported back. Now, there, there's a bit of ambiguity there. That's the, the point I'm trying to raise here. You know, some some are saying that outstanding issues in due course, and others are saying six months' time. You know, I mean, I, I realised that the pensions was on last week, and obviously the report came back to that, and, and it would be too soon to bring it back to this one. But I'm I'm happy to see a further report coming to this committee. But I mean, I think it's, I mean, it wouldn't be order to change to change it to reflect what you're saying that we would see it back in six months' time or or at an appropriate time scale, if that's what you want to do, John, or if you're reassured, fair enough. Happy to see a report in the appropriate time, chair. We'll see how it goes forward. So, as far as the minutes concerned, we can we can, we can agree that the dissent there. Right, okay, the minute agreed. Item number four. Scrutiny reviews. Liz, well, I haven't even looked at the. Report author, but take it yourself before we go any further. It is, Liz. Okay, Liz, can I ask you to speak to this one, please? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, we agreed at your last meeting a number of review headings that you wanted to look at in the coming year, and what you see in the appendices is the developed scopes, which tells you about a little bit more information about what the objectives of the review might be and how the um, officers are suggesting to you that you might carry out the review and the timetable. So very happy just to, to take comments perhaps one by one on each of the appendices just to make sure that that's exactly it fits with what you're looking for in each of the reviews. Yes, uh, um, and also just to highlight at 3.3, .3, um, which relates to the recommendation 2.1 as well, which is that we had identified that um, a review of council provision to health and social care, particularly about delayed discharge, might be something that you wanted to look at. We have had further conversations with the Health and Social Care Partnership, and it is indeed something that they are already reviewing through the Integration Joint Board. Um, and we'll be happy um, that the information about the review is all public, but we would be happy, perhaps, if it was helpful, we could send you the information as it becomes public so that you can see um, the progress of that work that the Integration Joint Board is carrying out. So I haven't spoken to you about Wally, but I thought you'd have a view, and I thought maybe it would better be, it's, and it is embedded within the report, and Liz has outlined that, but I thought it would better be absolutely open and transparent with that, so you have got a view, Wally. I do, Chair, and I've expressed that, uh, my view at this committee, and I did ask that this be something that this uh, audit and risk do scrutinise, uh, you know, that progress is being made in terms of delayed discharges, which uh, when you get the area committee six monthly report, uh, it doesn't look as if it is being uh, addressed per se uh, with the increase in numbers. It, it can fluctuate, but in the main they tend to be in the increase. And I would like to see this audit and risk look at this and see whether, you know, enough progress is being made. Do we have an understanding of the work that's been undertaken with the Health Social Care Partnership, how long that's got to take? Because I think what you're saying is, that, OK, this work's been undertaken, so it wouldn't be wholly inappropriate for us to start undertaking a piece of work right now. So when they've con any idea when it'll be concluded, so potentially we could see that and consider that as part of the further review? I don't have a time scale, but my understanding is it's coming through the scrutiny committee of the IJB, um, but we can certainly find you, um, find out more information about the time scale if that would help. Thanks for that. It is. It's come through the Audit and Risk Committee, Willie, so that you've got. Yeah, Chair, but that, and some may be on Audit and Risk from the Council. We don't know that, uh, and no doubt you can inform us, but it's for this 
committee to look at it and see if progress is being made, uh, notwithstanding that uh, the IGB is looking at it as a separate issue. It's for this uh, audit and risk to look at that and, and see what the impact is. Yeah, perhaps um, if it would be helpful, we could ask the Health and Social Care Partnership to bring a report here on the work that they're doing, if that would I suppose, allay any concerns. Yeah, Kevin, no, Kevin's no. I mean, I suppose, Kevin, was that a meeting that we had an audit and risk committee? We discussed it, but we think it's a meaty piece of work. But, uh, Kevin, I don't know if you, I don't want to put you behind the eight ball, but you're certainly happy to, happy to receive your view in regards to this. But I know there is a lot, a lot of work. It's very complicated, complicated complex. Uh, Kevin. Thank you, Chair. Yes, the IJB Audit and Risk Committee has agreed the scope of the audit work. So the, it's a joint piece of work being done by the NHS auditor, who is also the auditor to the IJB, and ourselves. So the idea is that um, we will be able to, perhaps for the first time, link up the two parts which contribute to the delayed discharge question at the moment, the proposal is that the report would come back to the IJB and this committee in September. That's when we're expecting to have it ready. So the work is underway. We're currently setting up the, um, the scope of the audit, or the, 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 if you like, the audit plan, uh, and we'll progress that over the next couple of months. And uh, the formal reporting date is expected to be September. So if you're content, well, even if we get to number, when we get to looking at the four, Potentially five, then, is what I'm hearing. So it could even be, okay, I mean, I think it maybe fits in as a fifth. So then it, if, if we do review it, but we'll have that discussion. If we do do that, undertake the, the review that you're asking for, it would definitely be after September. That's all I would have to agree to, I think. What I'm having, finding great difficulty in is that it's a health and social care partnership. And the council is part of that partnership. And we hear from Kevin that... Uh, NHS audit, uh, uh, auditor or internal auditor uh, is providing the IGB with, with that uh, information, whatever is necessary in that report. And we've got Kevin then also being part of that. But where do we fit as a council in this partnership to be looking at it and the progress is being made uh, within our partnership arrangement on the health and social care partnership? Uh, no, so I mean, well, we'll we ask you that, that role in particular is, okay, the Integration Joint Board through its committee structure is, is doing a piece of work that's got to be absolutely material, to say the least, in regards to any consideration that we as a council, as an audit risk and scrutiny committee, eh, any re review that we would undertake. So I think if you leave it till September, prioritise it to number five rather than number one, two, three or four, then at that point we can see it coming back after September and we'll have a load of information that's already been carried out that will help us consider that particular point. Right. Councillor Driver, then. Thank you. Thanks for that, Kevin. Actually, Chair, I think you're right. It's a wide-ranging issue. You know, delayed discharges is not just about NHS and keeping people in hospital beds and things like that. And I, and I agree with Willie. It's, it's a, a partnership at the end of the day and what input do we actually have to where those things are going. So when you say it's a, you know, a, a particularly complicated bit of work, you've also got to consider where... RSLs fit into the situation where the community planning partnership fits, in, fits into the situation. The economic leadership group fits into the, the situation as well. So it may be that in, after that initial report that you could potentially have a few others coming along on the back of that. But at the end of the day, what we would like to see, of course, is a reduction in the delayed discharges in Dumfries and Galloway. You know, um, so it, it, it's, it's really about what our and, and in my my eyes, the NHS actually doing working with those partners to ensure that the delayed discharges are are reduced. Yep, and that's very much the line of conversation we had at the Audit and Risk Committee of the Integration Joint Board, and that whole partnership working and how that uh, uh, works across the Priest and Galloway. You go beyond that as well. Sorry, uh, Katie, Councillor Hagman, I, I didn't pick up any there. That's okay, thank you, Chair. Um, it's just looking for some clarification, really. So we're we were asked to pick five topics for taking forward, and we picked those five topics. We've got the outline of four of them, the fifth one being the one on discharge. Have I got it correct, and did I hear correct when Kevin was saying that the NHS auditor and the council auditor are working collaboratively, in which case, surely their remit for that would be Appendix 5 to take that forward, and can that be shared with us? And would that be something 
that we would include? Because it, and if we're not going to include that, are we going to include a, a separate fifth one? Because we were asked for five topics, if we're only progressing four, what would be the fifth one? The, the fifth one would be as, as outlined uh, in 3.3, .3, so the Council provision to Health, so, so on and so forth. So that would be our fifth one. Take that forward, but what we're saying in information, we wouldn't start that review, so we'd start our workshops and so on and so forth. So the kind of conversation, uh, the questions you're asking there, we'd have at these workshops. Uh, all that would, would be bottomed out at that point, but we'd have a, a load of information and material that we could use in them workshops. So all the kind of questions you're asking, we're going to way beyond that, that level of question, uh, questioning and, and get to the points that you're looking for at that point, Katie. If, if I could just come back, I'm just trying to get some clarity on this because I'm aware that there's been meetings on this delayed discharge in all the localities, so that work is ongoing and the audit, and it's, I'm just curious as to why there isn't Appendix 5 in here, just summarising where we are actually at and where the NHS and the IGB are at with it. Yeah, because all, all we're here today, today really is to say, right, this is what we've got to review, and all this information you're looking for, that comes as part of the workshop. That, that would come at that point. It doesn't come at this point. We, uh, we've, got, we've got the scope, we've got the timetables, so we'd understand the piece of work we'd want to do and the time frames. So if we do prioritise at number five, the earliest we would come in is probably, uh, well, I would say de December or February next year, actually, looking at the time frames. But we'll look at the time frames in particular as we go forward. Kevin. Chair, if it would help. So the, the reason it's not before you today is because we haven't written it yet, the actual programme for the piece of work. So that's currently being worked on. If the committee requests it, it could, I think, be brought back in time for the next committee, just as a, as a for noting or for briefing. So it's, it will outline the scope of the audit and uh, what we'll be doing. And at that point, perhaps you'd find it quite helpful. I personally wouldn't, only because it's, I think it's for this committee, like going back to Councillor Scobie's point, is that it's, a, it's the review that we'll undertake and the information that comes with that will feed into that review. And we'll probably go beyond, going back to what Councillor Driver picked up on earlier, if we don't think the, the, the cross services across Dumfries and Galway, the partnerships, uh, community plan partnership in particular, I've looked at this in a proper manner, so looking at the housing needs, whether it's RSLs, whether it's private sector, whether it's uh, even spoke about Scottish Ambulance Service, the police, all these different services has, has an effect one way or another on the pressures that happen in acute services, therefore it has a pressure on delayed discharge. So, Katie, if that's okay, we'll move it. So, we we'll pick it as a fifth, but going by the time frame, we look at the actual timelines, the time frames that are put in front of us. It's probably got to be March next year before we get anywhere near it. Uh, but we'll have a discussion when we get to that point. I'll just check. Councillor Thompson, Stephen, I don't think anybody else had their hand up. Uh, thanks, Chair. It was just actually a couple of questions on the scopes as set out um, on page 15, for example. Uh, just where it's got the section on objectives of the review. Um, and I'm looking at sort of in light of recent decisions, but considering the financial and social value of CATs and the impact on capital receipts, which I think is something members will debate in other committees, obviously, but w will that scope include, because it doesn't actually refer to um, 2015 Community Empowerment Act or 2016 Land Reform Act, for example, and national, uh, what would you say, resources that have maybe been made available to support bodies uh, who are wanting to go through these processes, but how that fits in to our local way of uh, dealing with it. So I'm just wondering if that's implicit in the scope or would just be something that we should maybe highlight. And secondly, um, on the support for elected members scope, I'm aware that um, we also provide um, support for MSP, like uh, the equivalent of EMES, but for MSPs and MPs, etc. I don't know if that has a resource implication or whatever, but uh, are they included in the wider term elected representatives. Just, just before I bring uh, Liz in, then, I will go through them one at a time, and I think that's the fairest way to do it, and I think no, so, I appreciate the fact you brought that, that, that suggestion forward with the two. So if we go through the first one, which is on page 15, as Steve's already outlined, which is in regards to community asset transfer, yeah. I think it was particularly for your side, Jane, in particular, but Liz, do you want to answer the question for Stephen first? Yes, the, the specific point about will it look at the Community Empowerment Act um, another related legislation, the CAT strategy and procedure does include um, all the council statutory responsibilities under legislation. So yes, it's implicit um, in the fact that we're looking at the CAT strategy and procedure and how that is playing out and in future is likely to play out in Dumfries and Galloway. 
Councillor Scobie. Oh. Yeah, could I ask a question on that one? Because I think we're in uncharted water uh, on this one. And, and uh, I refer to a number of reports that have gone to uh, the Communities Committee and then to the Finance and, and Procurement on at least one. And we may have others uh, sort of coming forward where there is more than one organisation, one body interested in the uh, asset. Uh, and I just wondered if we'd be looking at that, notwithstanding again the toolkit, the right of appeal, uh, uh, and so forth, whether we are looking at that, uh, uh, what the effect could be uh, if there's no resolution to decisions that have been made uh, 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 and uh, a reluctance on part of bodies not to participate, for instance, if we're really looking at the scrutiny of that. So do, you, do you feel that's being covered within the objectives of the review? Because I think that's what we really need to do. And if not, we, need to, we want to make a recommendation to make sure that's a, a, a implicit within that. So we'll try and structure this in a particular way. So when it comes to the objectives of the review, you've got a particular opinion there. Do you want to put forward a proposal, Willie? And Liz will pick up on that. What do you want added to, to make sure you're getting your point? Because th this is ultimately, we'll, this stuff that we're talking about now is stuff we'll really be talking about in our workshops. We really have an open debate there. It's informal, we're getting on this line of questioning, but this is, today we're looking at, okay, we've got templates here, <coughs> appendix one, two, three, and four, we'll probably get to number five, we'll discuss that, but it, it's, it's about, okay, the objectives of the review, they've got a box here, does that suffice? The workshops, the research, and the, and the contributors, do we think that's the right uh, work format in there, and then we've got a timetable, I think it's important too. I think that's the three points we really need to bottom out then from there, but in the workshops we'll get in the level of detail that people are trying to get into today. And what I'm looking at, Chair, is and it, and it goes under objectives and the review, and it says the Audit and Risk and Scrutiny Committee will understand how the Council is supporting communities through the Community Asset Transfer Strategy and procedures by, and then it says investigating. What I'm highlighting here is, you know, uh, we, we could be in a position where we are not supporting communities, but putting community against community by the asset transfer. And, and, and it's, you know, whether we are looking at this and what effect this would have on a community, on uh, member members, in terms of uh, going into communities and saying, look, this is what's happening. So it's taking uh, experience and then applying that to the scrutiny and see what is the, the, the solution to a particular uh, that, that could arise. Perhaps if I could suggest under objectives of review to pick up that point, the very first point where it's looking at the outcome of agreed council cap, it could be agreed and current application. Would that assist in, in looking at that? Because you, you have had a number perhaps where you've, very small number, but where you've had multiple um, interests in, one, in the same property, and I think that's what Councillor Scobie is referring to, these ones which are perhaps more complex than one organisation looking for one building. So happy to, to add in and current application um, in that first bullet point. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Willie. Councillor McKee, Jock. I, uh, another thing, uh, I didn't disagree with what Willie's saying. Uh, should we be looking at the ability of these groups that take over these asset transfers their financial uh, position with regards to attracting funding, maintenance of the building, providing the services and all that sort of thing. Because the last thing we want is them wrecking a building and then coming back to us. And I think that's absolutely the heart of the, the second bullet point, which is about the sustainability. Because clearly their financial sustainability is a really important part of that discussion. So yes, that's certainly part of the, the sustainability idea. So we're looking at the next box, if that's okay, which is the, the workshop, workshops, research and contributors. Are we content with it? John, Councillor Campbell? Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy for this to go forward, although we, we are asking to scrutinise and uh, consider amending the agree uh, it, It's been a, a, a point of Mine uh, for a number of months now is uh, how do we 
encourage more people to use Skype and uh, how do we take this forward? I would like to see more of that in the objectives of the, the review, if that's possible. Uh, you know, because a number of elected members uh, are denied access to whether it's seminars or whether it's, you know, group meetings, admin meetings, whatever. And, uh, you know, I think, I think we really need to push this forward on the IT side of it to help elected members you know, to, to contribute uh, to discussions in the future. So I hope that would be picked up uh, as part of this uh, scope. Thanks, Sean. So we'll pick that up. And so that's in Appendix 2 you're talking about, isn't it, in, in regards to page 17, is it? Uh, Aye. 16, sorry. Sorry, 16, I mean. Uh, so we'll try and bottom out page 15 first. And, and, but we've picked it up anyway. Sorry, Chair, I and thought you'd moved on no, to the next no, one. No, so, no, so I did say the, the, the box below what I meant was the workshop research contributor. So, it just, so on page 15, so I'm absolutely clear. I should have made that a bit clearer there. Are we content with, so we've got an evidence session. So look at the community development empowerment manager should be there. Ward officers, two successful community transfer uh, bodies, two community councils uh, in regards to CTB localities. Then we've got the desk-based uh, information okay. there. Yeah, we'll, we'll just have an enhancement to the desk-based research, which will be the 25 CATs agreed to date and current applications where there's more than one um, organisation interested in a pro. Thank you for that. Stephen then, Willie. Sorry, Stephen, first of all. Yeah, just a very quick one. Uh, on the community councils, I'm aware that there'll be a number of areas where there's maybe not an established uh, community council um, and it might be a community development trust, or it could be another community body. Might be there, might be. I mean, that will feature in some places with some community asset transfers in terms of consultation locally and otherwise. So there's maybe something that that could be added to as well, perhaps. And I think if elected members have got particular organisations that think would be helpful to the, the, the debate, we've never stifled that in the past, so we wouldn't stifle that now. You'd have to stump up now, really, and say that. Councillor Scobie, <laughs> Wally, you were wanting back in. No, I'm conscious of the fact that, that, that there could be an appeal pending on, on one, on a, you know, uh, on one of the asset transfers, an individual group going forward on an appeal. Uh, but it's really we're looking at it, and what looks a pretty simple thing of, of you've got an asset and you want to transfer it over. But when you get into the nitty gritty, it does not become as simple as uh, as the, the members may feel in terms of the whole transfer, and, and, and there's been issues raised today. So what we're looking at is uh, successful, uh, uh, you know, and on two successful community transfer uh, transfers. But we're not looking at the ones that are, are difficult uh, that members come across. And, and there's effect, there's ramifications on the, 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 the local members you know, in terms of, you know, uh, are you taking sides? And, and, and you've got the whole issue. So it's not just as simple as coming to a decision. So, so well, I mean, I'm thinking, so see, see, when you look at the timetable below that, we're looking to go to the April and June committees and report in September. To me, that's because it's quite, there'll be quite a bit of de debate around about this. So, it's, see, so, we, so if that's the case, we'll have a workshop, a workshop or workshops between now and April, the next meeting. And as part of the debate there, if you've got a particular organisation in the west of the region, so to say, where it has been a division and such like, I think at that point you say, listen, we want to speak to them directly to understand what, what they're thinking. And we've done that in the past and it's been very helpful. Focus on here and I've been make, maintaining members. Officers are all on the front line. Yeah, I, I, and can come across quite abusive uh, outcomes. And I think, you know, in that respect, it, it's not an easy task. Uh, it can be in occasions, and, and the successful ones, I'll hire you, yeah, that was easy. But it's where there are difficult ones. So what I'm saying is, well, through the workshop, if if we come up with a suggestion, we think this is a difficult one, aware of it, I think we're all, all, all aware of one in the West, you can suggest that we speak to them directly. We can do that through the workshop uh, programme we have in place. If that's agreeable through the work, workshop at that time, obviously there's a, we have to get a majority of you. Jean. Um, Chairman, can, can I just be absolutely clear? Um, when we're talking about um, the the uh, desk-based research, which is information about the 25 uh, CATs agreed to date, and I wrote down and current applications with where there's more than one interest, but is that simply more than one cat 
interest or is it other interest because I was certainly taking it from, from the suggestion from the floor it would be ones that are more complex so it could be where the building is already up for sale right. perhaps so it's trying to encapsulate yeah. where they're more complicated than one community transfer body in one building well, We're okay with the timetable in regards to page 15 then to me it looks appropriate, absolutely quite ambitious I would say with that one Okay, excellent. Thanks very much. So on page 16, uh, this is one a wee bit close to my heart. So the subject is uh, support for elected members, business support and ward officers. It's to be an inclusive council. Uh, council plan commitment goes through its outcome to have an effective, efficient, affordable arrangements in place to support elected members. It was myself in particular that suggested uh, this one. No, no, I'll just go on. I'll take, I'll go on. Sorry, let's go on. No, I'm just going to, to pick up the outstanding question, which is, are MPs, MSPs included in the scope? And as it's currently written, no. The, the purpose, as I understand it, of the um, the review was to look at what support Dumfries and Galloway Council elected members have. How are you supported in doing your business? Thank you. I, I absolutely will pick up on that as, as we go through that. No, I'll pick up as we go through. So we've got Councillor Driver, Maitland, Hagman and Bell. So, Archie, you thanks, thanks very much, Chair. I'm just looking at the objectives of, of the review, and, and I'm aware that you know at one of the next full councils there's going to be a report on outside bodies, uh, and the, in particular the you know the amount of outside bodies we actually have in Dumfries and Gal. I think it's around about the hundred at the moment. You know, that's bound to have an effect on elected members and, and, and what support that they actually require. So while, while the objectives of the reviews are looking at the current level of support for elected members, chairs, vice champions, et cetera, et cetera, and investigating the arrangements in other councils and organisations, I think we need to see what actually the cost of outside bodies is on, on the council as well. Not just because of the cost, however, there are sometimes a risk, and this is audit and risk. Um, there is a risk if, if members make a wrong decision on those outside bodies. So I think it would be appropriate to see what support is available to elected members on those outside bodies and, and how much it actually costs. Thank you very much for that contribution, Archie. I think it's absolutely appropriate. And you've got that, please. We already have a commitment to undertake a review of outside bodies during this calendar year. I think were we to include the support of outside bodies for elected members in this scope, I'm not sure that we would be able to conclude it within the timescale that we've currently got um, here, because clearly there's hundreds um, of outside bodies that we would need to um, work with. So if you were agreeable, perhaps we could look, as we're doing the review of outside bodies, to incorporate the support that elected members get as part of that piece of work that we're doing it already, um, rather than build it into this particular scope if you were comfortable with that I think it or just, we might need to extend the timetable I, I think what, what Archie's picking up on is okay we're, we're looking at this and that's saying it's, it's almost covered uh, in other councils and organisations but I've got outside bodies along with that but it's how much support does an elected member get now so it's myself that suggested this I mean, where does it come from so how much because it went from having a member services to democratic services and there's a limited amount of support for elected members on this council and that's unusual across whether it's a fun up from own information gathering, whether it's in England or whether it's in Scotland, that's unusual. We normally have a member services in place, which we used to have. So we get elected into office, and normally that's the way an office, you'd have a level of resource, staff, so on and so forth, but we haven't applied that. So the reason I brought this one forward to say, okay, so you may be a senior member of the council or an ordinary member of the council, whatever level you're at, you still need a level of resource, and that is limited at this moment in time in order to be effective as a councillor. There's a whole range of different things that we are, I'm talking to the converted here when it comes to who knows what we do as councillors, it's, it's so wide and varied. So that ultimately I think it's appropriate that we consider what you're saying Archie as part of the review, we pick up on that information so it's in outside bodies and we can ask, so members, we can, members of the council will be sitting in that workshop and say, well, I'm on this outside body, this is how much support I need for it and this is how much support I get. So that can always, always just feed back as part of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, yep. Well, obviously, Liz has, has said there might be an issue with the, the timing of it and all that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty clear, you know, that the, the, the audit risk group came in April and June 2020. I, I, I would suggest that we need the fullest of information to make a decision going forward. If that means coming to June and then the one after, 
That, that, because there's already a report actually going to the bit Terpside Borish to the full council. So at the end of the day, that, that could support any information that's going forward there. So the timetable, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm quite comfortable putting to June and then the next one, but I think it needs to be involved in that. Agree with it. Yep. Excellent. Comes from Maitland. Jane. It's a, a pretty much the same thing, really. I mean, the, the desk-based research talks about arrangements for other elected politicians, um, and I was just wondering whether this would count, count as well. You might ask some of the English councils what they actually do, because I know that some English councils provide policy officers um, to support um, uh, groups and groupings. Um, so if that could possibly go in as desk-based stuff. Thank you. So, Councillor uh, Hagman, sorry, okay. Councillor Hagman, then Councillor Bell. Thank you. Um, it's a point that was raised by by Stephen about other elected members, but what's not been mentioned is community councils and the youth council, which are elected via Dumfries and Galloway Council. We help and assist in that coming forward, and I'm aware that certainly in my ward, and I don't know if other members have had the experience, I've actually had from community councils that they don't feel that they've got the level of support that they may require. Now, I accept that that's under the scheme of establishment, but I don't know whether there's room or if members wish to add this in to the scope of the report. My other point I've had, and it's one that was raised by John Campbell about the use of Skype, um, but I wonder whether, I know there was a request for caseworker for, to support elected members. Now, my understanding was that a, a licence was taken out for all the elected members to use caseworker. Are elected members using that? It's, it's not being mentioned in here. And, you know, clearly, if there's licences being paid, are they being made use of? And if not, will there be an option to opt in or opt out for the future? Um, the only other thing that I was thinking about, wondering, is whether there's an opportunity to look at in terms of elected member support to work remotely, the environmental and also the cost savings that that brings to the council to just somehow capture those ideas. But maybe that's for the workshop if we're giving evidence, we can gather that. Yeah, absolutely, yes, Katie. That's, that's where that is for. That's the kind of conversation we get into. But the community council thing, community councils are autonomous. This is not about community councils at all. This is about members of the Vincent Gallery Council. They have their own budget, which the council gives money towards, uh, they're, they're completely autonomous for us, and it, uh, this is certainly not a, a review that's looking at community council. What about the youth council? No, it's the Dumfries and Galloway council. This is uh, elected members of the Dumfries and Galloway council, so not elected members in Holyrood or Westminster. What see what they do, how they apply. We could may well, as part of the uh, uh, review process, we could may well look at so how, how do they resource, but I think they're on a completely different level of government. Uh, for, for what I can see, uh, but I would, this is absolutely about elected members of the recent Galway Council and what level of resource do they, do they get applied. And you're picking up what tools do they have but to be the, effective But the as youth well. council is what we have two ward members for every youth councillor. Is it? Are we looking at the resources? No, we're not. No, we're them? looking at members of the recent Galway Council. But Stop. are the youth council not members of the recent no, Galway Council? No, no, no. There's, for, no, there's okay. 43 members of the recent yeah. Galway okay. Council, and this is 14 of us here today. Full council on Thursday, hopefully all 43 will be there. <laughs> we'll be looking at each other uh, around the table. So, no, it just it's the Priest and Galloway members only. That's it. Uh, council members, not any other. So, in regards to. Graham, it's you now, Councillor Bell. Yep. Uh, Chair, we've had quite a, quite a debate in this already, actually, on this item here, for this particular item. Obviously, obviously I, I agree your sentiment regarding about uh, business support for. for for elected members, obviously the MSPs, MPs have different support. Obviously there will be cost implications there, obviously it will be discussed at the workshop. Uh, I've got great concerns about EMS and ward workers, you know, the role of ward workers, as far as I'm concerned, the ward workers are non-effective for me personally, but I know the ward workers are working well within other wards. I think that needs to be looked in as well, Chair, within the, the scrutiny review as well, if that could be noted. Okay, excellent. We'll make sure we pick up on that as we go through the review. John Campbell? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm sorry for jumping the gun earlier on, but, uh, you know, the likes of Skype, and Kate's just touched on it, you know, if, if members can, uh, you know, be part of the, the debates, I mean, things have to be pushed forward through standing orders. We need to try and get Skype or some sort of form where we can use IT to, to its maximum benefit. Uh, 
That's basically it, Chair. No, thanks very much. And I think it's a very valid point. So what resource do we have? It's not necessarily, necessarily just human. It is about, uh, do, do we think our phones are fit for purpose? Do we have Skype, the technology, so on, our caseworker? Are these things, and that's the debate we'll definitely get into at our actual uh, reviews. Timetable. We'll move on. Uh, we're getting pushed a wee bit of time over. So, I'll come to my key. Sorry, John. Just a quickie. Somebody mentioned EMS. Well, I, I'm no, I was never a friend of it, but I've started uh, using it in the last two or three months, and the improvements are absolutely tremendous. The response you're getting is almost in the same day, or certainly within two days. So it's been a great improvement there. So as you congratulate the staff that's worked on that. Thank you. Thanks for that, job. Actually, quickly, then we'll get the timetable. Yeah, it's just coming back to the timetable you suggested, and, and, and Liz mentioned about, you know, if we were to add in some of the things that's already gone forward to report in DG uh, full council, then I, I, I would suggest the timetable is the, the so the audit risk group in June and December, and, and then Dumfries and Galloway Council the first one after that. I'm thinking, actually, I think we'll try and stick to the timeline that's there. I think most of this will be desktop. Uh, I would say, because we're looking at outside bodies, I think, let's take it through there, and if, no, if we bounce, have to bounce, so building the local economy through the procurement process, we, I think we went about six or seven months over with that, but because the, the importance it had wasn't really an issue. But I think we should stick to a firm timetable, and I think most of this information should actually be sitting there just ready to, to, to pick off a desktop, to pick off something and lay in front of us and we start to consider that. And from what I can see, we've got to have a workshop, ideally before April, we report back to this, after that we'll have another workshop, and report to June, and if we think we haven't got enough information at that point, okay, we'll have another workshop and report back in September then onto the, onto the, 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 the actual uh, decision making after that or refer up to full council. But I don't think it's a big enough piece of work to actually to, to procrastinate and it whatsoever. We should keep an ambitious timeline on this. But Councillor Scobie. Just a quick one, and I heard Jane talk about going into the English authorities. Could we look at the legislation? My understanding is that legislation, if you're a group of two and more, you can get uh, policy uh, advisors and so forth. Can we look at the, the, the legislation, whether that gives us any indication where we need to go? But I think it's not just comparing other councils, which is important. It's looking at the legislation. For clarity then, in terms of the objectives of the review that we're adding in, um, perhaps some, if I could suggest something like investing, uh, investigating IT systems and applications particularly caseworker and Skype. Does that help just to get that sort of into the, the scope of the review? Thank you. Okay, okay with the timetable. And we'll pick up on them points, I suppose, that Willie said as well. So he's said when it comes to English, I think it's embedded within law there. I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's le le been legislated and they have that particular resource. So we will pick up on that, Willie. We'll get to that point. So page, page 17. Before you move on, if I picked you up right, you say as you go through the process here and we find we need more time, then that will be a decision by audit and risk to take forward yeah. and a bit of time. I'm, I'm happy with that. Aye. No, and that, that's a process. And sometimes so sometimes you get to a point you think, oh, this is quite simple. We'll just shift it on. And other times you think we need far more information. This is more complex. Come back to the point you were making earlier, uh, Archie in particular, around about the, the wider working with uh, delayed discharge. Again, some that's got to be a complex piece of work. I think this one should be fairly simple, at least to get a, 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 some kind of referral back up to full council. That's my own personal view. Uh, so item, uh, sorry, page number 17, I think we're on. Over. Yeah, appendix three. Uh, okay, <coughs> open up to members first. So we'll look at, if you don't mind, just objectives of the review. Archie? Can I just clarify a point here, Chair, that says in the bottom, um, investigate the arrangements for any similar funding in other Scottish councils. It's my understanding that the Town Centre Living Fund is done through the council tax on second homes side of things. So that's a budget setting thing. Do we really want to be going outside of the... Because, I mean, they may have different processes, different procedures, but is it really something that we need to do? I certainly think that the um, lead officer for the fund had suggested that it might be of interest to members just to see what other councils do, just as a sort of, sort of almost a standard benchmarking um, approach. So, you know, I think you could be right that there aren't many who who do it the way, who fund this kind of fund the way we do, but it we just felt it would be of interest to you to see what, what other councils do. Perhaps then, Jill, there's a step before this. 
before we get to that particular point in the in the in the review or maybe the way the, the, the research is actually contributed to. Um, we do we are members of things like COSLA and APSI. Um, they will have research people in place that they can send us information from other councils. Perhaps saying it's we should be writing to them and saying what have you got in this this sort of field? Um, rather than having to go to five, six, seven different councils, just there's one area where that information is already there. No, thanks for that, Archie. So the approach we'll take in regards to that is go to the, the collective rather than the individual. So in regards to the workshop research, is everybody okay with that? Or should we put COSLA and APSI in there? Is that appropriate? Jane? Um, yes, it, it's with respect to um, the objectives of the review. Um, if we're being really pedantic, it's not completely clear that um, we're going to investigate where the money comes from and then where it goes. So I think we need to look at where it actually comes from. Okay, so the source of the funding as well, I'll be as part of that. Okay, the one workshop it's saying there, uh, evidence sessions, strategic housing discussion with some successful applicants, Skype or visits with applicants in other areas, uh, and also the desk-based research. You mentioned COSL and, and APSI and such like, so we've collected over that. Okay. Timetable, okay with the timetable? Next one, appendix four. Subject matter, uh, this outcome is achieved from the Council's investment in the Public Social Partnership on Community Transport. So we'll go to the objectives of the review. Anyone got any comments in regards to that? Is it, is it a fair reflection on what the committee is asking for? I'm not mentioning really speaking too much of these at all because it was obviously with individuals who came forward. So with particular uh, groups that came forward with these suggestions, so I'd prefer, my preference would be that they actually lead, but everybody gets a chance to have their say. I'll take that as an OK, that you're happy with that. Workshop research. And Councillor Scobie? Yeah, Hello. just on that one, Chair, it's a, a hot topic of discussion just now in, in the Scottish Parliament, and that's, you know, uh, young people uh, and their transport. So where it says, clear understanding of what the contribution uh, transport has achieved in, uh, and future plans, it's really if there is a, 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 an effect on the, in the Parliament to the budgets and so forth that are under discussion just now, then what have we done for young people uh, in transport and, and how do we provide for that so I think we should look not just at vulnerable but, and young people can be considered as being vulnerable as well and under the workshops we can draw people in we've done that in the past been very useful if we want to draw somebody for the youth council or a particular group in, uh, of young people we can do that as well so that would be in the next stage though we could we could add to that council Hagman um, thank you. It's just in terms of our council commitments to the environment, and there's no mention of what the environmental benefits are to invest in more public transport and community transport. And is there a way that we can add that somewhere within the remit of this? Yep. As I understand it, this was about looking back at what had been secured from the £100,000 that the council invested previously rather than looking forward in terms of community transport because that's one of your transformation projects. So this was about looking at a specific point in time and a specific amount of money. Um, with that, these, these very valid points that have been raised about the wider issues looking forward, I think, will be picked up through your transformation project. Excellent. So I think that's absolutely right. So by looking back, we will look forward, Katie. But then that'll be something we work up through the through, through the uh, through the uh, reviews, and that'll get referred back up as the report to full council. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, just same point. I mean, I took from this because obviously community transport's a you know a very large and sort of far-reaching um, topic. But this is quite a narrow, specific thing about the PSP mm -hmm. initiative, where there's other partners involved, etc., or had been involved, um, and. What Liz has just said, basically, it's about that specific oh, funded period of time when we were investing in specific projects in the PSP. So it's not, it's tempting to sort of widen that out, but I mean, I think it's maybe best kept narrow at this point for, for that purpose. Well, thanks for that, Stephen. Council Driver, Archie. So, so on that point, then, Chair, considering future opportunities, what does that mean actually within 
the objectives of the review. Because, I mean, obviously in the future there may be opportunities for the council to take on a bus service, for instance. And I guess that, that's part of the scrutiny review process, which is that you identify recommendations for full council about what have you learned from this review that might inform the future. Excellent. Thanks very much for that. That was the exact same answer I would have given uh, in regards to that. So, we haven't got a five. I wonder if we maybe get a report back on that at some point, just to talk about it. Uh, yeah. So maybe to, to the next, we'll get a report back to that potential item uh, fifth review, Wally, which is what I think you put forward in particular. But ultimately, that wouldn't be starting before September this year, anyways. Thanks very much for that, everybody. I think we're back to recommendations. I think we've good feedback. So let's 2.1. We've been asked to note the proposed scrutiny reviews. Uh, the health and social care has not been developed as detailed in paragraph 3.4, and we've discussed that. And we have considered and amended at uh, 2.2. I think everybody's picked up on that. There's a lot of debate on that. Thank you very much. Item number five, I think we're on now. That is Richard. I think Richard's coming to talk to us about that. <coughs> find it. Internal audit reports. So the purpose of this report today is to, it's a standing item on the agenda of the committee to allow members to discuss reports issued by the internal audit. Richard, have you got any comments, anything you want to say in regards to this before we start? Yes, thank you, Chair. Just a couple of comments. You've got before you four reports which cover two aspects of our audit plan. Within our audit plan, you have an audit of payables within the Mosaic social work system and also a self-directed support payments follow-up. So the audit report on direct payments covers both those aspects. Um, I apologise, because of that there is an element of repetitiveness across some of the reports, so you'll notice a couple of common themes coming through it. The other thing I would like to say is that whilst there are aspects of social work practice which are touched on as part of the audit reports, the primary focus of the audit work has been financial as opposed to social work. Thank you. No, thanks. For that. I, like, I like the reformatted style. I have to admit, I compliment you on that. Uh, I found it much easier. We spoke about that at the last committee, and I thought it was really good and precise. I felt that the recommendations and the responses were much stronger, clear and concise. But I'll open it up to members. Councillor Campbell, John. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, will we just go through each one at, time, appendix right. one at a time? Thank you. Oh, sorry, is that what you are saying? Uh, yeah. All right, okay, Councillor. Young. Thank you, Chair. Um, looking through that, there's a, a great deal of trust involved, and I'm not sure t t relying on trust is the way forward financially. For instance, on page 25, um, 3.2, almost 50% of returns w were not made. John, I wonder, yeah. we've just kind of agreed to go through one at a time, so I wonder if that's Appendix 2. That's Remind Appendix we, 2, if, sorry. If, if we cover Appendix 1 first, is that right? Might have That's nothing right. to ask on that in particular, we'll go straight to... Have we got any points in Appendix Appendix 1? I mean, the obvious question is, OK, as, as the report author, author, you've been through this process, are you assured by the reassurances you've had for the, uh, the, the replies back from the service? Are you reassured that actually this, these, they are taking it seriously, uh, the, the internal audit and the recommendations that you've given to them? Apologies, yeah. If I can talk across all four reports, you'll see that you have management comments against each of the actions, and you'll see that on occasions the management comment differs from the recommendation, which we can touch on as we go through. But overall, I'm reassured by the seriousness of which the action has been taken. Thank you. Councillor Young. Uh, sorry, is there any others before we go forward with this? That's all. Councillor Campbell. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, just on Appendix 1 at the moment, uh, and I, I see the management responses and all that, but I, I would have thought that years ago that, uh, you know, these, these processes would have already been in place, that uh, I'm surprised that, the, you know, they're beginning to slip. I'm just wondering if maybe there's a reason behind that. Thank you, Chair. I can really cut. I'm noting that the things have slipped. I can't really say what the reasons behind that are. Apologies. I suppose, I mean, that is a. We might get to that stage, uh, Joanne, that, that is a, actually for the service delivers themselves, the management within that. I suppose that question would be 
pose to them because I, I mean, think they're not adhering to the policies that are in place, really, and that's the, it's been identified and picked up, isn't it? Uh, I don't know anybody else coming in, no, but the kind of question we like, we, maybe that's an approach we might take as we go on. If, if we've got any particular questions we think the management would be better to respond to, we'll maybe ask for them to come in and, and be addressed. Jane, you were wanting to think, were you? No, 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 no. Yeah. I was just going to endorse your, your suggestion that if we do come to that point, I think that's absolutely appropriate. We ask for, for reasons from the service itself. We have touched on that earlier. So if, MD, if we get to a stage today we think, okay, we're not, we're not content with the report or the recommendations that are there, we don't think, we're not confident in regards to the reaction we're getting, we can ask for that a future report coming forward. So that's what man management themselves will come and speak to the committee. Appendix number two, page 25. Oh, sorry, I, oh, sorry, I, I thought you were yeah. <laughs> I did, yeah. I did, if you don't mind. Um, locality, the, the management response on page 23 um, talking about spot checking uh, on a regular basis. Um, were, they, were they specific about what they would do? Uh, because the recommendation is that all existing cases without authorization should be reviewed and authorized. Um, and, and I think this is saying that ongoing that they will spot check. But I mean, that could be one once a year. And, you know, it's not absolutely clear what is expected. So was there any indication um, given as to what was going to be done? This, the, there has been a relatively new change to the structure for social work within this particular aspect, with the change of the way it's been managed. And I think there was a little bit of surprise by the fact that the, some cases hadn't been reviewed for more than a year. And I think it's a question of taking the time to ensure that over time all cases are looked at every year. Um, so I'm not totally sure what they mean by spot checks as opposed to a full review of all cases. Well, I think it's not unreasonable to say that actually that all cases should be, should be reviewed and then checked. I think that's, that's, that's what the recommendation says, and I don't see why we shouldn't be doing that. I think that's correct. Okay, Jean, we can amend that accordingly. It's a point that I'll bring you in a second, Kate, but Councillor Campbell brought it right back to the beginning through the minute. And he said, listen, I thought we were getting reports coming back. It would give quite clear about the outcomes, the recommendations that have been given, the reassurances we've had, and we would get information fed back at some point. So, going back to the spot checks, what difference has that made in real terms? Is it the same practice? It's still going on. That's the point we're getting to. So, it's something we could possibly come to at the recommendations and strengthen if we want. So, we're absolutely clear within the recommendations that we do see this changes that we're trying to affect through this, these recommendations that, that we do see that coming back as a, as a report at some point. We might be, we have to be absolutely clear on that in the recommendation. Councillor Hagman. Thank, thank you, Chair. It's kind of on the same point. Um, in terms of, you know, we shall do spot checks, who is we? Because it's not clear as to who. Is it the locality's social work manager? Is it, is it the social worker? Who is they? Because it's, it's maybe a slightly unclear to me. I don't sit in social work, so I don't know the, the, the processes within that, but it's just who gives the authorisation and who is going to do the spot check. So therefore, if, it, if we find it doesn't happen, who's ultimately responsible for that? Thank you, Chair. There is a lead locality social work manager for fostering adoption and kinship care. So the we in that case is that particular officer. I always take the, the stop back or the backstop position, ultimately the director or the chief social work officer as well. That's, that's the people who should be reporting at this level. I don't, will they? Yeah, Chair, I think it was said at the, the beginning uh, when the report was introduced that this only touches on the finance, not the social aspect. Uh, and I think that's an important part of this because when we look at 3-4, uh, then out of the 18 cases, uh, 10 were checked and, and, and child tax credits were deducted and in four cases family tax credit was deducted. In one case, one out of 18, I'm taking that to be. Uh, so, you know, uh, is our approach being proportionate and rational in terms of what we're asking to do and to look at however, you know, and I think there are some hundreds of cases. 
Uh, so, you know, is it rational to, to, to expect all to be reviewed? I'll put that question to yourself, Richard, really. I think it's, this is down to what current social work practice is. And my understanding is that for the current social work practices, we review all cases once a year in some form or other. I think the only disagreement or possible discussion we're having between ourselves and social work is how that is documented in terms of authorization processes. But certainly when I've been looking at, I have access to Mosaic as part of this audit, the actual social work side of it, and the expectation is I will see a review by a social worker of every case within the system. In some cases alluded to in these reports, that might not be strictly within a year, it might be 15 months, 18 months, but the principle is there. So I think the principle that every social work ca case is, we have a social worker looking at every case within a year is a reasonable one. Okay, thank you for that, Richard. Any other questions in regards to that? Appendix three, aren't we? So, in regards to Appendix three, I think we're on now. Internal audit. Two, is it? Sorry. Were you watching, John? Sorry, you were. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was quite concerned, page 25, that um, care homes seem to be receiving payment without confirming the amount of care or who, who the care was delivered to. For instance, a paragraph. 3.2, there was 30 cases investigated, 17 had made a return, but there was no physical signature confirming who made the return. But in 13 out of the 30 cases, there was no return. So there's no confirmation that the care had been delivered to the um, residents of the care home. I, I find that quite concerning. And I know there's a recommendation that says checks and confirm checks and conf confirmation returns from homes are reintroduced. Well, I do find it strange that they're getting payments before they confirm what care they've delivered and who the care was to. Thank you, Chair. This is an example of an established control which was in place and is expected to be in place, but which had actually slipped and therefore we're reporting non-compliance with the control that's been agreed and should be in place. My understanding also, if I may say, Chair, that actually it has been agreed that this will actually be reinstigated and put properly in place within the next month. So in future... Sorry, I can give a committee a reassurance that we're actually following that up and uh, that we'll... Uh, Revise our procedures to ensure that all the, uh, the in, in, in each instance we will be uh, ensuring that there's a return made from the residential home that's signed off. So will the will the return be made before the payments made? The difficulty is we're we're paying in advance in a lot of instances, and it's not until the the client unfortunately either leaves the home or, or dies that we get to know that the that the, 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 that that. Uh, there has to be a change in sort of circumstances. So, but I, I, I will I will say that our experience is that we're very very good at picking that up uh, and, uh, uh, and ensuring that any overpayment that's made is actually recovered. That's the MDL. In regards to this, yeah. Councillor Driver, then Kate. Thanks, Chair. I'm looking at the recommendation in 3.7, council procedures where a service should assess as being liable for the full non-personal care, etc. And then recommendation 3 is not agreed by the finance and information manager. So maybe one question here, I mean, are, are people means tested to get social care? Thank you, Chair. Yes, they are means tested to receive residential care and in these particular cases we're referring to they've been assessed as being liable for full care we pay with the full charges apart from 
the free personal care element, which is everybody in Scotland is entitled to receive. Councillor Hagman. Thank you. I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around the actual numbers of what we're looking at here, because it states that there's 1,100 payments in a typical month, and we looked at 30 of those random payments. Well, not the random payments, payments that were, were off dice, we hope. Um, it, in 3.4, it makes reference to the purchase ledger, and it reports 45 entries. Well, what was the total amount of entries that you were looking at? Because it, it says that there was 45 with a total value of, you know, what is that in a percentage of the, is that 45 entries across the 30? Or is that, is that out of the 30, was there maybe 100, but 45 of those were X amount? I'm just trying to get my head around the actual figures here. Thank you. I requested from my colleague behind me a list of negative balances within the purchase ledger. So that is 45 cases sitting with a negative balance for all residential care payments. So those 45 cases were typically... Sorry, if I can explain the, the way the process normally works. For most of the homes in Dumfries and Galloway, we have a regular turnover of residents. So if there's an overpayment because someone tragically passes away within the home, that will be recovered from the payment we make for another resident who's moved into that home. Typically, these 45 payments relate to a care home that could be in the borders or in Aberdeen or elsewhere in the UK, where we're not making any further payments to that care home. So these balances can be sitting there a while. And therefore, the audit point is that to follow up these, these balances within the purchase ledger, and either decide that the amount is not recoverable or to recover it from the care home. Yep. No further questions in regards to appendix number two. Appendix number three, page 29, starts here. Any members got any particular questions or points in regards to this? Councillor Young, join. I, I take it that all care providers are requested to use Care Manager 2000 to record their visits. And I note that the carer, when they attend the client's home, they phone the system. And I'm sure it'll be an automatic dial in, they'll not have to actually speak to anybody and then the phone when they leave. Is that phoning done, carried out on the carer's phone or on the client's phone? The phoning is done on the client's home phone, except there are alternative methods in place where, for example, the client might actually be on using the home phone when the carer turns up. So there is an alternative method of recording the start of the visit. But the expectation is that when the carer arrives, they will ring out on the client's phone and that's recorded. And so we know that the carer has been inside the home and has gone inside the front door. And they also have seen the practice where they do use their mobiles as well, or mobile supply from the particular provider, but obviously the, the landline would be you're absolutely clear who and where they are. Yep. No, no other points? Questions? Appendix number four, which starts on page 33. No hands this time. Regards yeah. to this. I think everybody's content then. John, thank you. Um, as somebody who's been part of um, a, a direct payments package, I know how the system works, and I noticed that you've now introduced payment cards rather than paying directly into bank um, accounts. Um, obviously, the the payments from that card will be for the care carers' wages. So at the end of the usage of the card, when the, when, when the care package ends, any balance on that card is unpaid wages. Is that correct? Not necessarily. The care, direct payment is calculated on the, ex, on the expected care package that should be in place, and that might differ from the actual employment or other services that's required. So the balance on the card could relate to either 
we're paying more than was actually required to deliver the care package in place. It could relate to, for example, the client going into hospital and not requiring care and therefore not employing the carer towards the end of the care package. There are a number of reasons why there might be a balance on the card towards the end. Other reasons can include, some aspects of the care package can include respite care, which might not have been taken, or the purchase of other services. Thank you. Can I come back in, Jim? And are you, are, are social work able to um, view the amounts on cards while the care package is ongoing? Yes, they are. They've got an online system which allows them to view not only the balance on the cards, but also what the cards have been spent on, what the money's been spent on in real time. So that's how it can be monitored. The issue within the audit report is I think there could be more effective monitoring done using the information that we already have. Thanks very much for that explanation. I'm sure that was the improvement action. A while ago, to be able to see that open transparent bank balance, so to speak. I remember there was some reservations over that particular method. Have we got anybody else looking to come in, Jane? No, I was just looking at the management response and it, it all seems to be sort of, um, yeah, we agree, or yes, we're doing this, or um, this one here seems to be quite smooth, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, um, and, and I, on recommendation five, certainly, um, uh, it's good that it, that, that was happening, that the management response is that those cards were checked and the payments were checked, the contributions were checked, and being done automatically. So it's obviously possible to do. Um, in other localities. So um, I, I think I'm saying this, I think, indicates, if unless I'm wrong, and I, I'd be actually quite interested to hear, Chairman, um, from the officers, that this is kind of an in instance of a smooth investigation uh, agreement and, and, um, and a good outcome. Would I be correct in that? <laughs> I hope so. We will have an opportunity to speak to the officers in six months' time. Is that now? Yes. Let's put on somebody that kind of times out for some reason. Didn't it? Sorry about that. I thought it was well, I didn't read light on. I thought it was still working. So, uh, page 19, the recommendations. Is that so? We have we've noted and we've made comments so on and so forth. I suppose we've had a number of reassurances as well in regards to the questions that have been asked. So, I wonder if there's any follow-up points that, uh, in regards to strengthening the recommendations, do we want to see particular things coming back or not? So, we've got Councillor Hagman, Maitland, then uh, Campbell. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chair. It's just back to the sort of point I made at the start of the committee of how do we track this, how do we follow it through, and there's a comment made that we'll get um, a chance of feedback in six months, but there's nothing in the recommendation that identifies that. So can we put something in the, in the actual recommendations because it, it's not explicit in there? Well, we'll have a 2.1 or 2.2, but we'll come back to that. Come to Maitland, then Young. Um, well, if we were to work through again in the appendices um, as to what we actually do want to say about them, I mean, the, the uh, suggestion, unless I misheard and really misunderstood, is that um, I think this committee agrees with the principle of every case being reviewed and documented as such annually. Um, and I think we were being told that this was not happening. So my instinct would be to say that that's what the committee wants to have happen, and can we have assurance in six months' time that it is happening? Okay, I'll take advice in regards to that. I thought it would be more like a straightforward, we'll get a follow-up update monitor report in regards to the outstanding actions that are there in six months. So it's speaking at that point, if we were un unhappy that any of the points that have been carried out, we then look to either maybe even bring back management or something like that, the kind of responsible person, whoever it may be, and, and talk to them, right, okay, you said this would happen, it hasn't happened, but we'll have a, a, a proper conversation with you. Council uh, Campbell, then back to you, Kay. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just going back to the very first question, you know, why did this slip in the first place? I think that needs to be addressed as well. Council Hagman, and we'll come back and try and summarise that. Thank you, Chair. It's, just, it's a broad question, really. At what point does the, the parent committee get sight of this? And does that form, does it go to the social work to then come back to us 
and we then get their response. Do they get sight of this? Because I'm, I'm just trying to work out the process, which is why at the very start I was asking, is it possible to almost get a table? We've, we've done the investigation, it came to us, it then goes to the parent committee, it comes back to us, and we can then tick each one of those things off. So we can see the full audit trail of how we go from the start to the end of this process. And then we can sign it off as we've, we've completed that. So I'm absolutely not sure in regards to process when it comes to, because we have no remit over our social work services committee, but I know we certainly have. So we've done internal audit report, uh, uh, reviews, audits, and we've brought them back to this committee. We've highlighted that. I'm not sure if that actually gets reported to social work, but maybe procedurally somebody else would be able to advise in regards to that particular point. Kevin. Thank you, Chair. Yes, so traditionally audit work um, deals with operational aspects, operational matters. The engagement is um, audit checking, or should we say agreeing with management what the control structure is, understanding that, confirming that control arrangement is in place. If it's inadequate, we report on that inadequacy. If, we, if it's non-compliant, uh, we report on that non-compliance. And always we seek to make some improvement recommendations um, ranging from good practice to absolute must-dos. So traditionally, uh, the reports have not gone to the service committees. They've been an engagement between internal audit and the service with oversight by this committee. So I think, you know, speaking personally, I think it's unlikely that service committees feel they need to be involved in this. If, if there was a serious problem, there are es escalation processes for this, you know, it would go through to that. Um, I, I'm trying to think in my history here of nearly 30 years, I don't. I can think of one case only, and it was not as a result of an audit, it was a result of uh, some audit work. It got reported back to the service committee. So it's, it's not happened in the past, and I'm not, I, at the moment, I'm not persuaded that there'd be a great deal of benefit from it, shall we say. I think the, the operational agreement and the oversight system works quite well. In terms of following up, um, yes, we've had a, a sort of follow-up process that's been split. We gave you a report perhaps a year ago, trying to explain how we were doing our follow-ups and following comments there and other discussions and so on, we've concluded that we are confusing you with the arrangements for follow-up. So we've reverted or we're coming to a six-month arrangement. So it will be as each report is agreed by the committee or reviewed by the committee, there will be a follow-up report done in six months' time at which we will bring service management. So rather than bring them in at this stage, we in effect give them a chance to progress the recommendations of the audit and then come back and be accountable to you for that. And that's the point at which you could almost move into a small scrutiny role, if you like, moving away from a direct audit recommendations and audit actions to a, right, how was the audit for you? Have you found it useful? In your responses, you said this, we'd like to know a little bit more about it. You know, you can have an engagement with the service, I think, in six months time. Not bringing them at this stage, I think, is helpful to us because it allows us to give you clear messages and give you clarity on what work we've done, what the limitations to that might be, and what the key issues are. And in six months' time, you can have more of an engagement, I think, with the service if that's what you choose to do. Or you may be satisfied that actually, yeah, this is, as Council Maitland said, this is a pretty straightforward audit. We've rattled through this, and there's no extant issues. Um, sometimes it will take more than six months, I think, for services to deliver recommendations. But again, that's a judgment for you at the time, whether you feel they're making progress and, and uh, w whether any explanations they give you for that um, are acceptable or not. So just before I bring you back in, I think we did make an exception uh, at the last meeting in regards to the pension. Robert, is that what you got? I see you've got kind of Robert Maxwell and such like was mentioned. But I mean, so the pension, I've seen that. They've, they've actually seen that. But I mean, I think that was absolutely the exception because we felt so strong as a committee. And I don't hear that. I don't, I'm not getting that feeling today. Listen, it's so strong that this needs to be. We didn't have a policy in place, so we, we created a policy, or we didn't. Have, we something completely against what we should have done. Some people are even stronger. Feel it was ethical or unethical what had actually happened. So, Keen, did you? So I just wanted as a two point one lesson. You want in, Archie? Yeah. I think there's something we can do before all of that. I mean, I have to. It would be remiss of me not to mention that I'm the. Council's health and well-being champion. And already we've had reports about, you know, some of these actions are unachievable by officers of social work department. 
Now, I'm not sure how many people understand the workload of social workers and their support and staff, but it is quite high. Now, there is something that we can do prior to this coming back, and that's quite simply ask for a fuller explanation of why that particular action can't be achieved and get it in writing so that we all understand that rather than having to go through another load of, you know, actions. I mean, some of the things that we have to do as an audit and risk committee is have some smart actions. If people are saying that these are not achievable, then that's not smart. So we need to understand why they are not achievable. And I don't think I've had the fullest of information to say why it's not achievable to do that, to do everybody once a year. And it may be because of workload and things like that, but I'm not sure why. So I think before we actually go into all of that, we need to understand why it is not achievable. That particular action is not achievable. So I'm, I'm, I'm just coming forward as making sure we have to take the responsibility of the health and well-being of our workforce in, in, in consideration when we're making these, these uh, action plans. I, wonder, I mean, I think we could probably cover that. So 2.1, as per the recommendation there, but if 2.2 would, would receive an update report in six months, and it'll touch on all these points that people are making, I think we could so the action's being implemented as we wish and come back to the point. If they're saying absolutely we will not actually uh, fulfil this recommendation, that'll be part of the update that we get in six months' time, or six months or approximately. Uh, in regards to our, our, our meeting cycle. So if we can move that forward to so 2.1, 2.2, we'll get an update report, two meetings for now. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. So I think we've got John Boyd and Colin Pentland. Both council. Colin's uh, around for the council and John's from Grant Thornton. Welcome both of you very much. So we are on item number six. It's our external audit draft plan for 1920. The purpose of this report is the Council's external auditors have published the draft plan of work they intend to undertake for the 1920 financial year based on their analysis of risk facing the Council. So I would imagine, is it yourself, John, that's speaking to this? Thanks very much. Welcome, firstly, and thanks very much for speaking to this. Hey, thanks, Chair. Um, yes, this is our external audit plan uh, for the year ended uh, 31st of March 2020. Uh, the plan and our, our audit work is undertaken in accordance with international standards in auditing and Audit Scotland's Code of Audit Practice. Um, in line with the Code of Audit Practice, the plan is really split into two key areas, the audit of the financial statements and our wider scope responsibilities. So I'll just briefly touch on some of the key aspects of, of both of those. In, in terms of the audit of the, the financial statements, I think the, the kind of key concept um, that we define in our plan is our materiality. So with any financial statements audit, um, we, um, using professional judgment, um, we determine a, 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 basically a, a balance or a figure that we consider would be material to use of the accounts essentially a, a figure that would influence the economic decisions of the users of the accounts. And within our audit plan, we've set that at 1.5% of gross expenditure. For public sector bodies, including local authorities, gross expenditure is, is the usual benchmark that's, that's applied um, because it's a key aspect of the user of the accounts, and we've applied that 1.5%. We also include within our report the amounts that we would um, report back to the committee of any errors or adjustments we've identified during the course of the audit, and that's set at £250,000. So as part of our annual external audit report, we'll report specifically on any balances or, or transactions that we've found an error in relation to, the, to that amount. For the financial statements audit, we use a risk-based audit approach. And in doing so, um, we consider uh, the Council's arrangements, internal processes, as well, as well as external factors. And within the audit plan, we've included um, four specific, um, what we determine as being significant risks of material misstatement. So these are areas where there'll be essentially a heightened risk that the accounts may be misstated. And we um, have additional audit procedures around that planned throughout the year. So our audit plan touches on each of those. So that's the risk of fraud and revenue recognition, the risk of fraud and expenditure recognition, management override of controls, and valuation of property planted equipment. And these risks are consistent across um, 
the risk that we would apply to, to local uh, local authority bodies, given the value of balances um, that are there and, and the inherent risk of, of misstatement. The plan then the details um, our planned audit approach across each of those areas. In terms of the wider scope areas under the Code of Audit Practice, along with the audit of the financial statements, we are required um, to report and conclude on um, four areas that are um, considered wider scope audit dimensions. And these are financial sustainability, financial management, governance and transparency, and value for money. And what our audit plan does is essentially touches on those based on our four years of experience at the Council um, and, and considers each of those areas and what we propose is, um, for specific follow-up as part of our annual external audit this year. The other area I would just touch on in terms of the plan is just a planned uh, timetable, which we've included a summary of in the plan. And essentially, uh, we have agreed with management the timing of our audit work and when that uh, will aim to conclude um, for the September submission uh, d deadline, reporting back to the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee. The other uh, outstanding point you'll notice just within the appendix to the plan is in relation to audit fees. Um, audit Scotland prescribe uh, audit fees um, for all um, Audit Scotland appointments. Um, these were issued in late December, so we're just in the process of agreeing uh, the fees with management. Once those are agreed, we'll update and submit to Audit Scotland and back to the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee um, for the end of uh, for the end of March, but happy to take any questions you have on the plan. Thanks so much for that, John. Much appreciated. So, Councillor Driver first. Th thanks very much, here and, and you know I, I do like the way this is set out. And, 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 and but I have a question on page fifty with the significant risk identified in waste management, and what your response to that significant risk mm -hmm. will be. Uh, you'll be aware, as, as, as is said in the, the statement, that we brought the PFI contract back in house in uh, November last November 2018. Sorry, um, there are some key aspects of that, that the particular waste collection service moving forward. In that, it needs to be flexible because we don't know about changes from legislation or SEPA regulations and things like that. But we've also got the deposit return scheme coming forward in. 2021 as well. So I just wanted to make sure that you are aware of those potential options, but the flexibility that must be required by the council to deliver that waste service going forward. Yes, yeah, th th um, thanks for the for, for for the question. In terms of in terms of our planned audit approach, one area that the the wider scope audit dimensions. Uh, tries to do is, is tease out how councils are demonstrating good value for money and essentially through decision making processes how that then is deci um, decided. That's not just in relation to is it the cheapest option or is it is it the you know most cost effective option. It's essentially looking at all those sort of wider aspects so it doesn't meet your requirements, um what the performance level like and, and that's that, that sort of area. So it's a it's quite a good example of one where we can focus on as part of our annual external world at work and evidence in that uh, process through. Thanks, John. I'd got a similar similar kind of comment to my Ms. Mayor would just make sure to ask something on this in particular in regards to your actions. So you've got to look at make sure the council is uh, for the best value process, I suppose. I don't really know for a fact that they are putting in the best waste uh, for the constituents in the Bruce and Galloway. But you, you have covered it. You've covered it with Archie's, with Archie's answer. Councillor Campbell, John. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm looking at page 42 here, uh, right in the middle at the top there, where it, uh, it recognises the impact of the McLeod judgment. Uh, we, ha we had this last week on pensions. Uh, it doesn't actually say how much it is here. I don't know if it would be relevant to say it's going to be around about the £6 million mark. 
uh, although it, it was considered to be unique in 2018-2019 and not systemic of any increased risk of material misstatements in the current year, uh, but it's still a relevant risk and although it's estimated at around about 6 million, I think, you know, th that's something that uh, we need to be aware of. Any response to that at all, John? Yeah, so the, the specific reference to the um, McLeod uh, case in relation to materiality um, is actually really just supporting the, the decision not to lower our materiality threshold. So one of the trigger points to reduce your materiality is where you've had in the prior year uh, material audit adjustments. So essentially the re reference to the McLeod there is, is um, saying that although there was an adjustment in the prior year, it was in relation to McLeod and we wouldn't expect there to be a material impact this year or a material adjustment to the draft financial statements this year um, in relation to McLeod. It was essentially a kind of one-off um, type adjustment or we would expect it to be a one-off adjustment. I'm aware that the McLeod is an ongoing, um, an ongoing case and actually the resolution um, to how pension funds um, will treat McLeod is, is um, still being debated. Thank you, John. So on the same page, page 42, oh, sorry, Councillor Mayton first and I'll get... No, just, just, just going to ask. Um, right, well, much cleverer people than I will, will be able to uh, ask this, but I, I suppose we've had in the past a misstatement of accruals, a big one, and, um, and we're going to be looking at this in the next year. And I, I suppose, really, I'm, I'm asking, what's your role in respect to that? Because as far as we're concerned, you know, this is an external audit and the public will be saying, well, we spend quite a lot of money on external audit. What could we expect? And, and how, does that, how, how is that in relation to that particular aspect reflected in, in this plan here? Jane, just, if you don't mind, because I was going to ask a couple of points, I suppose, mm -hmm. on the same point, so I just maybe could answer both at the same time. So I'd picked up on page 25, uh, maybe a bit tenuous, but it's, we've got a... 42, sorry, not 25, 42. Uh, we've got a box in the bottom left-hand corner in accordance with Audit Scotland's planning guidance during 1920. We will have particular audit focus around the risk of fraud and corruption in the Friesen Gallery Council's procurement arrangements. So I just wondered, what did he mean by that? So materiality as well, coming back to the point, so that there's a particular investigation going on at the moment, and you thought materiality would have picked up in, in that particular point, because it was 3 million and growing, I think, I'm very concerned the fact that figures of that size and scale weren't picked up on. So maybe, maybe I'll leave my two points there at the moment, uh, but it, it, it sits exactly with, with the points that uh, Councillor Maitland just, just picked up on. So just touch quickly on the procurement um, uh, point. So the um, Audit Scotland's planning guidance that they issue every year have, alongside the wider scope, um, requirements they will also request auditors to look at specific areas um, and one of the areas they've asked all auditors to look at um, is around procurement and the risk of specifically on procurement fraud within the um, appendix i've put in a wee bit more details just under section audit scotland audit deliverables uh, i'll just see what page it is sorry in your pack it's 20 of the report but Page 59, I think. Yeah, yeah, just going on to page 60, um, you'll see there the top box covers what we'll specifically do. So that's one of the specific requirements that we're required to report back um, this year as part of our audit work. Um, so Audit Scotland have issued guidance for auditors to consider as part of that when considering procurement fraud. In relation to accruals, so as part of our external audit work, um, as you'll see with the identified significant risks, particularly on expenditure, um, with particular focus on accruals. Um, accruals, particular long-term accruals, can be an area of estimate and judgment. So where, um, if it's accrued income or accrued expenditure, um, the first point of call from an external auditor's point of view is looking for third-party documentary evidence of that. Ideally, it would be confirmation of payment, so either payment made or payment received, because that's essentially the best source of evidence. Um, the other 
source of evidence we would get would be any correspondence with the third party to evidence that income being recognised or the expenditure due. So that is essentially the test we would do. There can be instances where there's areas of judgment applied. So this would be where a certain amount is accrued based on a contract or um, an agreement with a third party. Um, and it could be in relation to the level of service delivery. And then what we've got to do is review the management's judgment around that estimate and essentially confirm if that's reasonable um, or, or not. Uh, and we would do that at every financial year. One of the tests we do as part of our audit planning is then looking back, do a retrospective review to see if there's any indication or any areas of focus, and that then feeds into our audit risk assessment. That's essentially what we do. The concept of materiality is that what that does is then shape the level of sample testing and focus you would have on um, areas of estimate and, and judgment as well. CG still thinking, but I've still got real concerns over the level of accruals that are built up in a particular department over a number of years. The way that was being uh, presented to the council through its committee structures and the fact that both, again, internal and external auditors have not raised any concerns around that and if it's still the same structure that could be going on right now and not being presented to us in the same way so I just think maybe a further conversation even some away from from the committee to say okay what do we actually have to do to make sure that even though I mean it was a large chunk of a it was around 20 to 25 percent of a particular budget on an annual basis wasn't it being recovered uh, potentially that's our understanding I'll keep it as loose as that so if that was the case then that should have that that should have raised hairs, but it wasn't being presented to the council. So that so materiality across the whole budget, like okay, that's not a large number, but in that particular case, to that particular allocation, we in the detail it was material to say the least, and it was not being presented to members uh, in a felt an appropriate way. And I don't know if you've just captured that yet. Yeah. So another small point, unless you want to come in, Jane, but another small point I did pick up on was just on page seventeen of your report, uh, John. Governance and transparency. It's just along the, the, the wording that says the effective governance arrangements, including oversight and scrutiny, are critical to enable the council in delivering its strategic objectives, statutory duties, and it goes on to say the Prince Gallery Council has can you continue to develop and governance arrangements in place at the board. It's the board. What, what one is that? Should it be the board? Should it be some? It's just that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Apologies. That should be should be the council. Just. Okay. Excellent. I thought that's what it was. So I just. Put, it's on page 57, mm -hmm. the fourth line down. Just about being draft, I suppose, and that you can, I thought it maybe something could be amended, that's all I was thinking. Not being critical. Any other members got any other points they would like to raise in regards to this? It's I uh, so just be sure, so page 57 of our report, 17 of, of uh, Grant Thornton's, just the governance and transparency. So it's the fourth sentence down, and it refers to the board. That word will be changed to council, the board to council. Right here. Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Oh. You've got another one. Okay, we'll pick these. This stuff up out with. Yeah, bye. We'll pick that stuff. A couple of small things here. So recommendations. Members are asked to note and comment on the external audit draft uh, plan for 1920 as per the appendix. Okay. Thank you very much. We mentioned. So hopefully you've picked up on that, John. Thanks both of you and Colin very much for for coming to talk to us today. Members, I haven't got any, any further business. It was, went 10 minutes beyond what I hoped it would, but thank you very much for the good <laughs> behaviour. Thank you. Cheers.